In this video, I would like to share a shocking but important interview with you. However, before I proceed, I would like to introduce the person being interviewed and explain why it's crucial for us to listen to this short interview. Meet the man Noriel Romini. He is a globally renowned economist, professor, and investor who has gained fame for his accurate predictions and analysis of the world economy and financial markets. He is the co-founder of Robini Global Economics, the chairman of Robini Macro Associates, and a professor of economics at New York University's Stern School of Business. Robini's insights into economic trends and financial markets have earned him the nickname Dr. Doom, owing to his accurate prediction of the 2008 financial crisis. He has been called upon by governments, financial institutions, and media outlets for his insights on economic trends, particularly during times of crisis. However, he's not just a pessimistic forecaster, but also an astute investor with a well-diversified and dynamic investment portfolio. Robini's investment philosophy is grounded in his deep understanding of global macroeconomic trends and his ability to identify undervalued assets. He has a long-term approach to investment and believes in the value of compounding. His portfolio is diversified across different asset classes, including stocks, bonds, real estates, commodities, and alternative investments, such as hedge funds. In a recent Bloomberg interview, Noriel Robini discussed the current turmoil at Credit Suisse and its potential impact on financial markets. He also talked about inflation and investment strategy. Robini suggested that Credit Suisse could be a so-called layman's moment that is too big to fail, but also too big to save. First, we explore what happened with the Credit Suisse crisis and the impact of the bank's collapse. In the start of 2020, Credit Suisse faced a scandal involving spying on an outgoing wealth management executive, which led to the resignation of then-CEO Tijan Tian. In 2021, the collapse of Archegos Capital and Greensill Capital resulted in $1 billion in losses for Credit Suisse and another shakeup in management. In January of 2022, Chairman Antonio Horta Osorio resigned from the company after it was revealed that he violated COVID-19 quarantine regulations. In late summer 2022, Credit Suisse's new CEO, Ulrich Kerner, announced a strategic review. However, the review was hindered by an unfounded rumor that the bank was on the verge of collapse. This caused clients to withdraw 110 billion Swiss francs in funds during the last quarter of the year. In order to improve liquidity and investor confidence, Credit Suisse revealed plans to borrow up to $54 billion in January of 2023. However, by the middle of March, Saudi National Bank, the bank's largest backer, announced that due to legal obstacles, it would not provide additional funding to Credit Suisse. Credit default swaps increased, suggesting growing concern that the bank wouldn't be able to repay its debts. Late in 2022, the Saudi National Bank made an investment of about $1.4 billion for a 10% stake in Credit Suisse, making it Credit Suisse's biggest shareholder. Early in March 2023, the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank in the United States was one of the last events before UPS bought Credit Suisse. This prompted the American government to make broad assurances to depositors that money would be available, but it also caused fear throughout the international banking system. Without shareholder consent, the executive arm of Switzerland approved the takeover. Robini shares his views in a recent interview with Bloomberg. Well, compared to 2008 right now, we don't have the credit risk yet. We're not in a recession, and the losses that occurred seem to be related to market risk. A number of financial institutions did not realize that with rising interest rates, the price of bonds would fall. And last year, uh, U.S. banks alone have something like $620 billion of unrealized losses on their securities with a capital of about $2.2 mm -hmm. So the average loss is about 28%, will reduce significantly their capital ratio, the tier one ratio. And for some banks, actually, the numbers like uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, of course, the number was 100%, but there are still other regional banks where right. they had to realize losses that be 50% of their current capital. He said, while we do not currently face credit risk, we are not in a recession like the 2008 financial crisis. However, losses that are related to the marketplace and other financial institutions may not yet be fully realized. 
With rising interest rates, the price of bonds may fall. U.S. banks alone had around $620 billion in unrealized losses on their securities last year. All right, your Roman's numeral this morning is $620 billion. U.S. banks had $620 billion in unrealized losses at the end of 2022. That's when assets decrease in price but have not yet been sold. It's happening because surging interest rates are pushing newly issued bond rates higher and driving down the value of the old bonds with lower rates making them less attractive. The plunge in the value of bonds is just one of those things that led to the recent downfall of Silicon Valley Bank. While the average loss was around 28%, some banks had a two to one ratio. For instance, Silicon Valley Bank had losses of 100%, but regional banks were better off with losses of around 50%. Well, uh, they can be active today, even if they have a system that is uh, delegated. However, the problem is that Credit Suisse, by some standards, might be too big to fail, but also too big to be saved. It's not clear that unlike the United States, the federal system has enough resources to engineer a bailout. And uh, what they need certainly is more capital. And the question is whether they're going to get that capital or not. Otherwise, bad things can happen. When asked about his knowledge of Swiss regulators and their distance from the credit squeeze crisis, Robini noted that they could potentially act today, even with their delegated system. However, the problem is that Credit Suisse may be too big to fail and too big to be saved. Unlike the United States, the Swiss federal system may not have enough resources to engineer a bailout. While tighter regulations may be necessary, it is unclear whether otherwise bad things can happen. Well, it's important because the SVP was only about $150 billion of assets, while in the case of Credit Suisse, we're speaking about at least $700 billion. So anything will happen to Credit Suisse will be of systemic effect for not just the European financial system, but also for the global financial system. So if, uh, if Silicon Valley Bank creates a ripple effects in global financial market, something bad happening to Credit Suisse will be an order of magnitude more severe, something more like a Lehman moment. Robini stated that Credit Suisse is a major player in the financial world with at least $700 billion of assets. Therefore, any issues or problems with Credit Suisse would have systemic effects not only on the European financial system, but also on the global financial system. The impact would be much greater than the ripple effects seen from Silicon Valley Bank. In fact, any negative developments at Credit Suisse could be as severe as the Lehman moment. Uh, I don't think so. I think that the dilemma for central bank has gotten even worse because the latest economic data for inflation in the Eurozone or the U.S. suggests that inflation is still too high, is falling, but is not falling as fast as the Fed or ECB wanted to be. So based on what's the economy doing right now, we need to hike and hike much more. The Fed should go at least closer to 6%. The ECB should bring the depot rate to at least 4%. The problem right now, we're facing a situation of financial instability, and financial instability would suggest to stop hiking, maybe even cutting rates, maybe even resuming quantitative easing. And what the Fed has done is backdoor quantitative easing. But if you do that, you have a risk of the anchoring of inflation, inflation expectation. That trade-off existed even before. Raising rates would have led to stresses in financial market, like last year, where bond yields uh, went much higher, credit spread widened. That stress is becoming more severe today because now we have systemic financial problems, but we are also in a situation where inflation is still way too high. And the idea that this financial stress is going to cause inflation to drop is not yet in the economic data. So there is a dilemma for central banks. Noriel Rubini also discussed the implications of the Credit Suisse crisis on monetary policy. He was asked about the assessment made by Thorsten SOC that rate hikes are out of the picture and there may be 100 basis points of cuts in the next year. Rubini disagreed and said that the latest economic data for inflation in the Eurozone or the US suggests that inflation is still too high and it's not falling as fast as the Fed or ECB wanted it to. Therefore, based on the current economic data, the Fed should go for a hike closer to 6%, and the ECB should bring the deeper rate book at least 4% growth. Rubini also noted that the dilemma for central bankers has become worse due to financial instability. 
He believes that financial instability would suggest stopping the hike, maybe even cutting rates and resuming quantitative easing. However, this approach is risky, as it can lead to inflation and inflation expectations. Even before raising rates, the stresses in financial markets last year, such as higher bond yields and wider credit spreads, were becoming more severe. With the current systemic financial problems, the situation is even more severe. Rubini noted that inflation is still too high, and the idea that financial stress will cause inflation to drop is not yet supported by economic data. Noriel mentioned that the credit tightening trend is affecting financial positions, especially in terms of credit spreads. Meanwhile, bond yields are decreasing, indicating an ease in financial conditions. However, this could potentially lead to an economic slowdown. On the other hand, inflation is currently too high and expected to remain high due to factors such as a tight labor market, which could cause persistent inflation. Although tightening financial conditions could potentially lead to an economic slowdown and lower inflation, there's no evidence of this happening yet. This creates a dilemma between achieving economic stability with lower inflation and maintaining financial stability. Well, the safety is not in long-term treasuries. I've been writing for it for over a year. You know, if average inflation were to be, say, 5%, 10-year treasury eventually have to be 7%. Today, they're around 35 Last year, you lost 20% on your safe bonds more than you lost on your S&P because yield went from one towards three. If they go from three and a half to seven over the medium term, there'll be further bloodbath on $23 of long duration risk assets. The solution is gonna be short-term treasury, tips, gold, precious metals, and other hedges against inflation. That's where you have to go. And investors only now have started to realize it, that that's where you have to do. Banks realized that they had taken a risk where they believed they were safe. Noriel was asked about where the safety lies now, and he responded that long-term treasuries may not be the safest option. If the average inflation rate is around 5%, then a 10-year treasury bond would eventually have to yield 7%. Last year, safe bonds lost 20%, which was more than what was lost in the S&P due to the increase in yields. If yields continue to rise from 3.5% to 7% over the medium term, it could result in a significant loss on the $20 trillion worth of long-duration risk assets. Therefore, the solution is to invest in short-term options like gold and precious metals, which can adjust during inflation. Investors are now starting to realize this and are beginning to make investments accordingly. Recently, regulators planned and authorized UBS's acquisition of Credit Suisse. However, given the size of the bank and its assets, the deal's over $3 billion price tag seems modest. Switzerland's biggest bank, UBS, is to buy its troubled rival, Credit Suisse. UBS, the largest bank in Switzerland, is acquiring its troubled rival, Credit Suisse, in an emergency rescue deal aimed at curbing panic in the global financial markets. UBS has agreed to buy Credit Suisse in this historic government brokered deal aimed at containing a crisis of confidence that had really started to spread across global financial markets. Bringing UBS and Credit Suisse together will build on the best skills available in the Swiss financial center and enhance the combined organization's ability to serve our clients and deepen our best in class capabilities. UBS officials announced directly after the news of the acquisition that they intended to shrink Credit Suisse in the upcoming years, possibly by selling off portions of the bank, though details are still lacking. There are important differences between terms like bailout, merger, and takeover that are often used to characterize circumstances like Credit Suisse's. When a person, firm, or organization contributes money or other resources to a struggling business in order to keep it from failing, this is known as a bailout. A merger is a form of contract in which two businesses are combined into one, frequently with the struggling business being absorbed by the thriving business. A successful bid to acquire another business and seize its assets is known as a takeover. The UBS Credit Suisse transaction is formally a merger. So there are wide-ranging effects resulting from UBS's acquisition of Credit Suisse. The future of the bank's 50,000 employees and offices around the globe is still up in the air because UBS may decide to take on some or all of them while closing or dismissing others. 
After the transaction, UBS's AUM, or Assets Under Management, is projected to be in the neighborhood of $5 trillion. The failure of Credit Suisse may also have an effect on Switzerland's standing as a strong and stable financial nation. The loss of one of the nation's oldest financial organizations, the bank that funded the building of Switzerland's railways, could devastate Swiss people in and out of the banking sector. Time for the important announcement. Now you can join our community of 5,000 plus members and active stock market investors and receive the latest timely stock market and economy related updates like what stocks to buy and what stocks to ignore or sell to save your portfolios. Economy and stock market related commentary and alerts are shared regularly on a weekly basis. You can also chat with me during market hours and ask me any questions. Join our community on Discord through Patreon. Upon becoming a member, you'll be able to enjoy some great perks. For example, you'll be able to receive proper buying and selling alerts for a wide range of potential stocks. We'll also share tips and alerts for option trading. You'll receive a weekly guide for stocks performance and updates with technical analysis. You'll be able to chat with over 5,000 like-minded members all the time. And you'll also be able to chat with me during market hours. I'd be delighted if you could join us. The link to join is given in the description below. Thanks, and see you on the other side.